Hey everybody, welcome to the Carlin Community Connection. Uh, five o'clock on Wednesday, it's actually not Wednesday. I'm taping this ahead of time with our guest because she is extremely busy and she was able to wedge a little bit of time in there for us. So we're actually taping on a Tuesday and we're gonna be showing it on Wednesday. So I would like to introduce the honorable, the wonderful superintendent of public schools, Kathy Hoff. And she comes to us by way of Tucson. Well, actually she grew up in Oregon uh, attending a Japanese immersion program, actually went through and studied Spanish and Japanese over at uh, University of Oregon, came to Arizona, started her teaching careers, I believe a speech path, path no, after preschool, then a speech path uh, down around Tucson area, moved up to Phoenix in 2016. Her last position was in the Peoria Unified School District and then became in 2016, the superintendent of public instruction. Please welcome Kathy Hoffman. How are you, Kathy? Good. How are you, Eric? Oh, I'm terrific. Is it all right if I call you Kathy now that you're in the big cheese position? That's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, um, I, I really, you know, I appreciate you making the time. I know that you're extremely busy. First of all, how are you and your husband doing health-wise? We're all doing well. Thank you. My, my husband was working in the hospital in the COVID-19 unit for a couple weeks, so we were taking extra precautions during that time, but fortunately, um, it's been it's been two over two weeks now, so we we're, we're in the clear. Fantastic. How about uh, your department? It's a rather large department. Is everybody healthy? Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, I haven't heard of any cases of any of our staff, and we we quit. We actually transitioned very quickly to telecommuting for almost everyone in the agency, and so it is roughly 600, right around 600 people that work in the department, and. So I was very proud of our department for being able to make that transition fairly quickly. And, um, and now we're actually working, we have a, a subcommittee working on our plans for the future of what that will look like when our staff returns back into the building. Okay, you brought it up. So let's get right down to it. Uh, this is an extremely difficult time for educators. It's an extremely difficult time for everybody. But uh, I know last week was teacher appreciation work and my appreciation for our profession um, knows no bounds. If there was ever um, a way to kind of reinvigorate how we look at the teaching profession, it has been how people have adapted to this new uh, normal. What surprised you, uh, Superintendent Hoffman? Has anything kind of just stood out to you? Well, first, I couldn't agree more, and I was also thankful we could appreciate our teachers even more so last week. Um, but you're right, our, our teachers have been, and educators have been rising to meet these challenges, to overcome significant obstacles. So we're just so grateful for how our educators have stepped up through these difficult times. Uh, but I would say in terms of a surprise, I, um, I we knew there were, there, we knew that a digital divide existed in Arizona, but through this COVID-19 crisis and with the shift to transitioning to so much online learning across the state, I, I actually was quite surprised at just the, the, um, the impact of that in terms of limitations to access to technology, to whether it's directly to the internet and not having access to broadband or whether it's not having devices at home. Um, also even just the, the literacy, the, the capabilities of kids and families being able to use the computers at home or for teachers if they had enough even I heard challenges around having enough bandwidth to be able to do things like Zoom from home. So I think that was really eye-opening for me that while we knew this was an issue, now it's become a much higher priority for our department. And, and I think our schools also have seen a shift in their role that they feel more of a responsibility to make sure that their students have access to computers and internet at home. Yeah. and. Um... I, I do want to say uh, we're talking with uh, Superintendent Hoffman and I am running for the state house in District 23 and she being on this show is in no way an endorsement of my campaign. She's just here to spread a little of 411, a little drop a little knowledge on us and uh, really just take part in expanding the minds of our community. So thank you again for being here. Um, tell me what kind of digital divide are we talking about? Is, is there any way to capture the number on that? We're Still aggregating the data on that. We sent out surveys and we just have, it's gonna take some time to clean that up, but it's well over 100,000 students um, that are having, are having difficulties. And, and that number has probably 
it probably keeps shifting back, you know, back and forth a little bit because our schools have been actively buying devices. And in the beginning, there was all, everything was on back order as the whole world shifted to telecommuting. But um, I know that districts have had more success in purchasing um, devices recently. So it's gotten better in some ways, but then we have parts of the state where they, like I said, they don't even have the internet infrastructure or even cell phone reception. Um, so then the hotspots don't work without cell phone reception. So we just, there's just layers upon layers of challenges. And we, there's, um, we're a part of a statewide task force that's looking at internet access. And then I'm also in the process of creating a tech task force that's more education focused that I'll be kicking off in June. Wow. So when you say you're going to create a tech task force, um, you've been very inclusive in the people you've included, uh, inclusive including, a uh, little bit redundant there. You've included a lot of diverse people into these different groups. Can you tell us, so tell me all the different people who take part in some of these committees. What, what, what are the who is it? That's a long list. Um, so yeah, typically when we were putting together a group, we, it depends on the topic, of course, but like, let's, let's actually talk about, um, we have another task force right now, very active, that's, that's focused on the plans to reopen schools for the next school year, which I know is a hot topic. So that task yeah. force has actually surpassed 75 people. And we continue to add people to that group, depending on where we're, where we're realizing that there's even gaps in the um, where we realize we need someone's expertise in a certain area or we want to make sure we're including a certain community so um, our process for putting together some of these types of committees and task forces and groups like that was um, we we tend to start with our education associations so we have um, participation from the superintendents the school administrators groups the school board association aea um, we for this one, we wanted to make sure to reach out to teachers specifically. So we recruited our current and former teachers of the year for Arizona, as well as nationally board certified teachers because they are our teacher masters as well. Um, we, and then we were thinking too, like regionally, we wanna have people from around the state. We want rural and urban areas represented. We want superintendents and principals. And, um, and then on this task force, it was really important to have, because there's a, such a big public health component of this work that a lot of people have questions around whether like things like social distancing or wearing masks or those types of questions. Um, so that for that, we're leaning really heavily on the expertise from the Department of Health Services and the Arizona School Nurse Organization, because we really wanna be receiving that information straight from our medical experts. Um, we, and of course, for any of our task forces, we also want to make sure that, that um, we're in inviting the State Board of Education, um, the education folks from policy people from the governor's office, um, the, the charter school board, the charter school organization, because it really needs, you know, for a statewide plan to be successful, we really need to have contributions from, from all groups that it's impacting and it's helpful to have them involved from the beginning so that then later when we implement the plans, there's greater buy-in across the state. And that's one thing that I think a lot of people gloss over. They, they don't really understand that just because you have all these different people in there, not everybody's gonna get their way. And even the people that might go in in one way and come out another, they have buy-in because they've been part of the process. That's why perhaps the, what you're doing is going larger group, going slower, actually allows you to go faster at the end. So I commend you for that. Um, can you give us a little hint as to what's kind of coming, what's bubbling up? Mm -hmm. For the reopening schools? Yeah. Work? Yeah, so we're, that group is tasked with putting together a statewide plan or framework that we expect to distribute by the end of May. And so it's coming up real fast. We're working very hard to get this out. And so some of the different components of this plan, we actually broke into subcommittees. So we have um, like we have one subcommittee that's focused on supports for students, another for supports for educators and school staff, another supports for families um, and thinking about like family engagement. Um, then there's another area is looking at instructional models and the, the school finance policies around having different instructional models because that's a huge question is 
is there going to be more online learning next year? Are we going to have, are we going to have different kinds of schedules? Like, are because some schools might want to have kids come in in the morning or only certain days of the week, or you know, people are are exploring different types of options because they want to be prepared for any any type of scenario. Um, so, but in order to have that kind of flexible hybrid model or anything that's different, it has a significant impact on school funding because our, our typical school funding model is based on, on attendance and the kid needs to be physically in the building to count typically to count for that attendance. So that, that piece could require legislative action. Um, the other subcommittees, um, we have, like I said, the public health component of that, that the Department of Health Services and our, our medical experts are working on um, because I think that's, I think actually that's the section people want the most. <laughs> that's what right. the, that's the questions we keep getting. And, um, and then again, our teachers and school leaders will be providing guidance on um, academic supports as well. But um, so it's, it's a pretty comprehensive group of thinkers and so they're working quickly, and um, I know that it's information that people are, that they kind of wanted yesterday, but we're just, we're working as quickly as possible because to be as thorough as possible. Yeah, and uh, I think what needs to be said over and over again is, I, I, I saw this was Maslow trumps blooms. Mm -hmm. So people's safety yeah. comes like ahead of their learning information. Yeah, and the social, the social emotional pieces will be a big part of this plan as well for for our students, for our staff, for our families. Um, you know, we're gonna continue to advocate to have more school counselors, more social workers, because I think those services are gonna be even more critical than they ever have been before. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange dichotomy we have. We have a, um, an economy that's going to really gonna get rough, right? We're, we have a high unemployment rate. Uh, we have an economy right here in Arizona that's overly, um, uh, overly fixated, fixated on sales tax and personal income tax and those are the things that are really going to suffer so they're going to be looking those people that make the budget to cut where we actually are going to need more because like you said anything that we have to do that it creates a, a safer environment is going to be more money um tell tell you know everything is an opportunity right so we have we have a, a school system here in arizona that's funded about 49th in the nation it would take roughly $4 billion to get us just to average. We uh, have some of the largest class sizes in the nation. We have some of the largest, we have the largest counselor to student ratios in the nation. We are on the wrong end of every one of the metrics. We have an opportunity to kind of build a school system right now that can last the long term, one that can uh, be something we are proud of. What opportunity do you see as we get back into educating kids as a way for us to actually do some systematic improvements? Is there anything that's coming through your task force or your particular uh, team? Well, I think, I mean, so in terms of budget and those types of um, funding issues, of course, most of that has to come through the legislature. Like we have, we, you know, that's our role is to just continue to advocate. And that's actually been one of the biggest heartbreaks for me during this COVID-19 crisis is that I act, there was actually some really good bills moving through the legislature um, before, before all this happened. If, for example, there was a bill that would have increased special education funding by $50 million we were hopeful to see $48 million added to the school safety grant, which could be used for hiring social workers and counselors. Um, so that was really devastating for me when all this started happening and we started to see that there were gonna be budget deficits. It's like, well, I, I really don't think they're gonna be looking to add as much as, they, as we thought they might be for this, for going into the ne next fiscal year. Um, so that's been really devastating, but the way I've been framing it in our conversations with the governor's team, with our um, with legislators, I've been starting to have um, regular, or we're starting to have more like check-ins with our legislators during this time. And so what I've been strongly messaging is that- Tell, tell Jay Lawrence I said hi, okay? <laughs> I don't think he's on my calendar, but <laughs> he's not in leadership. <laughs> he's not on the education committee. Um, so, but with the ones we are, the ones that we can have a little stronger influence with, 
we, um, so my messaging is that we, this, we cannot afford cuts to education during this time. Our schools are providing a critical lifeline to our families and communities that we, our schools have delivered well over 2.7 million meals during this time, just during, just in the last couple months during the crisis alone. The social emotional supports that are being provided um, and also that our schools, those are, and our schools offer good jobs. These are jobs we need to protect. It's a matter of economic security that they offer healthcare benefits and retirement benefits. And it's, these are stable salary, you know, they can, they can be salaried or we have hourly as well, but these are good jobs. So we need to protect the jobs we have and ensure that our schools have financial stability because one of the concerns going forward is, is enrollment because there's a, a concern that if families choose to, um, to enroll in an online school rather than go back to the brick and mortar building school, then that could cause a significant decrease in funding in itself because we calculate a, a big portion of that school funding is based off of student enrollment. So there's a lot of concerns, but we are already aggressively on the, you know, offensively trying to get that message clearly across to our other state leaders who have more control over the budget that, that we need to have stability and we cannot afford any cuts to public education. Yeah, and, and I admire your work with both parties. I admire that you have come out with Governor Ducey uh, together, have worked to, to put Arizona interests first. Um, I do have a problem with the people who have been in charge of this state from that one party for the last 25 years. And I think you bring up a very good point about uh, dollars are through enrollment. And it used to be that schools were paid on last year's average daily membership, the ADM, basically how they're funded. And in one of the um, ways that uh, the Republican majority tried to cut funding was they said, oh, wait a second, let's go to current year funding. We should only be paying for the kids that are currently enrolled. And while it makes sense, you have to plan for the next year. I mean, this is very simple stuff, right? You look at history and see how you and, and you plan for going forward. So we are going to be left with how many teachers can we hire? How many support staff can we hire? Because we know that people are going to be worried about the health of their children. Health comes first, education comes second. So our enrollment might very well suffer, but our needs, uh, the needs of the community we do serve, those are actually increasing. So we have this strange dichotomy where we can not, we have to work together to understand that education is the foundation of our neighborhoods, of our community, of our democracy. So when these hands are together, I'm praying that people work together to understand that this is all of Arizona. Yeah, and I do think that's maybe one of the bright spots of all of this is I, I think that that work that our schools have always done, the, that our schools, you know, of course, reading, writing, math is very important, but that our schools offer so much more than that, that all of the wraparound services of social emotional supports or whether it's special education services or helping connect families to resources that they need, the nutritional assistance, all of these components I think have become even more visible to the public. And our, I, um, I've seen some polling that was national, nationally done polling by um, NEA that showed that um, there's, this is one of the highest levels that families have been supporting their schools and their teachers more than ever because there's just a stronger connection and um, it's become just more publicly visible how critical these um, schools are for our communities. Yeah. And what I think is really kind of strange, and I want to go back, and it's, it's political for me. I, I know that you're above the politics. But um, we, we've had this majority, we've had this majority in place for 25 years, and they've expanded and continually expanded vouchers, um, savings accounts for kids. Uh, we have had issues of misappropriation of dollars that is quite well documented. The law allows for a certain level of oversight. And I, I'm looking at the majority party and saying, you say you are fiscal conservatives. You should not be wanting people to take trips to Hawaii on taxpayer dollars. So one, how much are you, I mean, this is before you, right? So, so the superintendents before you were Republican and they were asking the same thing. 
what would be full funding to oversee the ESAs, educational savings account, and then how much are you currently getting? So it's been a minute since I looked at the precise numbers, but um, we, we are definitely underfunded and um, they did in this past, in the budget they, they actually passed in their skinny budget, they did increase it by a little bit by, um, I think it was about a million dollars, but we were requesting significantly more than that. I think more on the, I'd have to look back at the numbers. I haven't been thinking as much well, about just, ESA. Just just generally, yeah. you're not. Yeah. This isn't part of the yeah. quiz, okay? Right. No, it's fine. Um, but it's basically been very flat, and while the enrollment numbers have significantly increased, um, and ultimately, it is a matter of having enough staff to support the program and to be able to retain that staff um, has been a hardship because of just the, the incredible workload that that team endures. Um, we are shifting to a new system, a new online system that should help with the accountability piece. Um, we're moving to class wallet as a way for families to allocate their funds, which should help limit and um, provide some more like some guardrails. Um, so it's more the families can see what are approvable, what are already pre-approved products that they are allowed to purchase for academic purposes with their ESA funding. Um, rather than buying what they want and then submitting their receipts and then getting approved later. Um, so it's kind of flip-flopping that process. Um, so we're still in the process of transitioning to Class Wallet and, um, but there, it, yeah, the, the program, there's been a lot of, a lot of issues. It's, um, it was not set up for success under any administration. It's been severely underfunded and I applaud the team in our department who has been working under difficult circumstances um, to to do what they can with that program. That's a very generous way of putting it. Now I'm going to ask you just as I would ask some of my kids when they got in a fight, what would the other kids say if I asked him? So what would, I want to ask you, Ms. Hoffman, what would the other person say that doesn't want to fund oversight? What is their reason? Um, the, what I've heard, and this is a, a quote, is it comes down to this, quote, heavy hand of government mentality of um, they, they want to give the families the funding and tr they say trust the families to make good decisions for what their kids need. But we have, even under my administration, we have found cases of, of incredible fraud of um, families using the funding to just pay them to pay themselves um, the cash. And luckily we've been able to catch some of those cases through our audits, but it's um, people are able to manipulate the system sometimes. So it, it, it is it, like when you do think about it in terms of fiscal responsibility, it's, it is mind boggling when to say like just give it to the families, just just give them our tax dollars <laughs> and rather than having oversight and having the proper staff but there it's it's always a challenge for well i'm I, you know what I, I love that quote it's uh the heavy hand of government i'm sure they're the same exact way when when a welfare check goes out or something yeah just here take the money we know we, we trust you you can do the best with that that you can you're not going to spend it on scratchers you go ahead um, this, this is just crazy. I mean, it is just crazy. You want to hear something funny? I got a joke for you. So I was online and, uh, and, and the story came out about some of the families having upwards of $100,000 on their debit cards that they were going to use for college, right? They were saving all this money. So I am trying to, ha I'm having what I think is a reasonable conversation with somebody, but it's on Twitter. So of course it's not reasonable. And, and I said, how are you okay with a uh, family having $100,000 of your tax dollars to spend on their education? She says, well, and, and I'm putting the voice to it because it was written. She goes, well, they're, they're just really uh, good at getting a value. They, they are very, uh, they are really saving because they are going to the lowest price vendor. So they're, and I'm thinking, listen to yourself. Are you really serious? I mean, people really get into contortions just to get themselves straight with their own minds. It's crazy. All right. Hey, Kathy Hoffman, 
Uh, I do want to say you're doing an excellent job. You just keep it up. Stay above it. Stay above the fray. Do right by the people. Work with all the parties. Get, get us that education funding. We can get a system in place that we can all be proud of. I do have some questions for you because we like to let our guests kind of show their human side because we all are humans. And I feel that once people get to see that you are a real person, they might treat you a little nicer. So I'm going to ask you some questions about your University of Oregon with uh actually craig harris went there he's a big duck fan <laughs> so speaking of ducks where what company did the university of oregon get their mascot from it's based off of donald duck disney very good excellent okay Let, uh let's let's hear let's hear this one um the the football game that you have your interstate rivalry between the university of oregon and oregon state what is the special name for that game that would be referred to as the civil war hey very nice all right you're two for two uh this guy famous alumni uh has something to do with shoes do you know uh the company or who this guy is definitely nike um uh, no no i'm blanking on his name but <laughs> uh ch a chess piece not the rook but the another name for the rook Oh yeah, Phil Knight. There you go. I knew you could get it. Okay. Um, oh, here's one. Uh, this guy, he, uh, he's a famous guy. His name is Ty Burrell. He uh, went to Oregon in 1987, studied theory, theater. What show does he play Phil Dumpy on? No idea. <laughs> All right. Modern Family. Who has time for TV? <laughs> I love Modern Family. Okay. Hey, um, I just, I, I can't get over, uh, here, here you are. You're probably one of the youngest people in higher elected office in the United States. You didn't have, uh, many people betting on you to come out of the primary you won. You were a clean elections candidate with a limited budget. Nobody bet on you to win the general election against the guy who was the father of charter schools. And, you know, we know who he is and you won. And that was very surprising. What is extremely surprising is how well you have done to just put education at the top, the forefront, leave everything off the side, kind of like your Oregon duck, everything flows off of you. And uh, I just couldn't be more proud of the work you're doing. And it just goes to show that if you put a teacher in charge, they do good work. So. Here's to you, Kathy Hoffman. Thanks so much for coming on. We hope that you'll come on a little bit later. Folks, uh, look for her at the secretary, at the, uh, the, the, the superintendent of public instruction. Hey, how do people, if they want to kind of give their comments on opening schools, last question, how, is there a place where they can log on and kind of give comments? Um, well, you can, people can always find me on social media. We receive messages through the superintendent Hoffman accounts. Um, and another way, if they want to send an email, they could just send it to our communications team, which is communications at azed.gov. Right. Arizona Education. See it here. Okay. Thanks, Kathy Hoppin. Have a great day. Thanks for working Thank on our behalf. Thanks for everything, Eric. Bye. Bye.